I don't know about you, but I'm the man I am today because of the relationships that I have fostered through my life, through my parents, through family. And uh, when I first started this church, I, I had no pastoral experience, zero. And uh, I, I really admire a minister. You might have heard of him, Dr. Jock Hayford. Uh, he was the pastor of a Church on the Way in Van Nuys, California. And so uh, I decided when I first got out here, you know, I'm going to go out and sit under the mentor of a great man of God. And there's about 45 different pastors would gather for a week at a time. And I went out to California. And when I did, I met a wonderful guy named Dave, uh, Dave Ferranti. We became friends immediately and started renting Mustangs and all that together as we put the top down and worshiped God and his son. <laughs> we had a good time going through the courses together. We discussed our church. We discussed our family. We prayed for each other. And we became friends. It's hard to believe it's been over, like, what, 13 years now. We've been buds and uh, been friends. And uh, through our relationship, God has challenged and grown me. I can call him up and say, hey, hey Pastor Dave, can you just give me a I need prayer for something. He'd be able to call me. I'd be able to call him back and pray. And, and in fact, uh, because of our relationship, uh, we came into contact with Jeffrey Parker, who actually designed this building. So you see how everything's worked together for good. And so I just thank God so much for what God is doing through him. He is uh, the founding pastor of Bay Valley Christian Center, which is in Bay City, Michigan, um, the same place where the Bay City Rollers came from. <laughs> so I'm dating myself now. And him and Cheryl began their church almost, what, 20 25 years ago, when he was eight years old, he started the church. And him and Cheryl have started the church, and, and, and through God's grace, it's grown to be a church over a 1,000 people. They've planted churches. They do wonderful things. He has something called, he has a, a thing in California that helps uh, mentor people in Yosemite National Park. Just a lot of great things. But most of all, I will have to say that Pastor Dave's a real guy. He's authentic. He's real. And uh, it's that that I always liked about the guy. He was a real guy. Him and his wife are just an amazing couple. Would you please welcome back to Cornerstone Church, um, David and Cheryl Ferranti. And Cheryl, can you please stand once again? I would just say thank you to Cheryl. We just love you, Cheryl. Thanks for being here today. And, and thanks for being obedient and having a word from God and, and letting us know about that. And so we believe in that. Well, Dave, it's all yours. Be easy with her. Okay. All right, how about that? We're here? All right, excellent. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. I'm glad to be here. I was here last year when there was just steel and, and metal and they didn't have the roof on yet. And uh, I got around Pastor Bucci and he's telling me, this is going to be here and this is going to, the stage is going here. And he's, you know, he's acting like the building's already done and all I could see is metal uh, building. And sure enough, I showed up this uh, morning and uh, you guys have done an amazing job. Think of it this way. 2,000 years ago, Jesus dies on the cross. He rises from the dead and there are people like you out still building churches today. Isn't that cool? You know, think about it. The church is not just the building and the structure. It's God's people. And you're not here by coincidence. Coincidence. God's got a purpose and a plan for you and for this church to reach more people with the love of Christ. Well, this morning I want to tell you a quick story. Cheryl and I have been married about 30 years. And when we first got married, she'd wake up all, every morning and make the coffee. And after a couple years of that, she was doing her devotions one time, and she found the Bible. She said, wait a minute, the Bible says I'm not supposed to make the coffee. I said, what? She said, you look right here, Hebrews. <laughs> uh, you know. All right. Well, <clears throat> that's about the best I can do this morning. So let's get into the Word of God. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews, if you have your Bibles out this morning. Um, I want to talk to you about a subject I've entitled, uh, Don't Resist a Rest. Don't Resist a Rest, R-E-S-T. God's purpose and plan for His people, that they would enter into a level of trust and rest in God so that they could hear His voice and do what He says, because the Bible says in Proverbs, uh, Psalms 29, verse 4, it says, the voice of the Lord is powerful. Can you say Powerful. One whisper from heaven can change the course of your life. As a teenager, and uh, when I received Christ, I, I began to learn as I read the scriptures that God would begin to, 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 to lead me. He began to just give me words. He began to show me things. And when God would show me some things, I would begin to simply do what he said. I began to learn to trust him in levels I could never trust him before. I'll, I'll never forget this story. I, I'm 17 years old, uh, and... Uh, I needed some money for a pair of uh, pants and some shoes. And I asked the Lord, I was out witnessing in one of our parks in Michigan. And I said, Lord, I need a new pair of pants. I need some shoes. And, 
and I don't have the money for it. Would you help me? And I, this is no joke. I, I'm out witnessing, telling others about the love of Jesus Christ, and I look down, and sure enough, there's a, a $50 bill on the ground. I'm thinking somebody's got like a fish hook and some line. You know, I'm going to go reach for it. They're going to drag me across the thing. So I'm, I just stood there. I waited there for about 10 minutes, and 15 minutes went by. And I'm just looking to see if somebody came by. No one came by. I finally picked it up. And I, it was a real $50 bill. And I went out. Listen, I know I got pants and a shirt, uh, pants and shoes, but I got a, a two shirts with it. And I began to learn in those early days that God was going to lead me on a journey where I would learn to trust him when I had nothing. And this morning, God wants you to know that there's a level of trust that he wants you to have that no matter what you face, no matter what you go through, no matter what you experience, you have a God, listen, who will never leave you, he'll never forsake you, and he's got a purpose and a plan for your life to accomplish things, listen, that you could never accomplish in your own strength. Somebody say amen to that. Well, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll start there. Let me give you an overview, if you will, of this, this book. Um, God was using the people of his day, listen, in especially uh, chapter 1, he was teaching the people of God that Jesus was superior to angels. Now, this was important because a lot of times people can have idol worship. They can put things above God, and, and a lot of people want to worship angels. They want to uh, uh, make angels the, the, the way that God gets his stuff done. And so oftentimes in the Scripture, God's got to lay the, make it very plain to us, make it very clear that Jesus Christ is superior to the angels. Chapter 2, he begins to talk, to talk about the faithfulness of the Son, how today is the day of salvation, that Jesus was able to die on the cross and rise from the dead. And because of what he did, he brought salvation to mankind. Chapter 3, the Bible talks about, listen to this, and this was back in the day uh, of the, of the uh, Old Testament. Jesus was superior to Moses. Now, this is a big statement because you've got to remember Israel and the patriarchs were huge. And so when they say that Jesus was superior to Moses, for a lot of them, it would rub them the wrong way because they go, what are you talking about? Moses is Moses. And as great as Moses is, the Bible says Jesus was superior to Moses. Well, chapter 4 goes on to tell us about entering into this rest. I want to talk to you about that real quickly. So turn to chapter 3, and uh, we'll start in verse um, 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him. As Moses also was faithful in all his house, for this one has been counted worthy, listen to this, this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, and as much as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But listen to this, verse 6. But Christ as son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Now you've got to understand this then. Superior to the angels, he talked about what God had done in the world through Jesus, and now he's talking about Jesus being superior to Moses. Now listen to this in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, can you say today? If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as is in the day of rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. Now you got to catch this. One of the reasons why Jesus was superior to Moses is Moses did not lead the people of God into the promised land. I don't know about you, but over the years, we have to understand that our anger cannot produce the righteousness of God. The Bible says, Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And what begins to happen is because, remember when Moses said to the people, he's talking about the children of Israel, and he said, these stubborn, stiff-necked, rebellious people, oh, that's not a heart to have for, as a shepherd for the people. And what happened was in his frustration, in his anger, in his uh, 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 getting upset with the people of God, listen, remember what happened? God said, I want you to speak to the rock, and when you speak to the rock, I'm going to let living water flow out of that rock. Remember what happened? He didn't speak to it. He took his staff and he struck the rock. 
Now watch this. You've got to catch this. This is, this, is, this is crucial. Because of the frustration and anger of operating in the flesh, he missed what God told him. And this morning, I want to challenge you. Some of you are in danger of not entering into your rest because you're trying to accomplish in the flesh what God meant to happen by the Spirit. Cheryl and I have had the privilege of starting churches and building buildings, and, and it's amazing to me how many people can get whiny and complainy about stuff that doesn't matter about nothing. I don't like the color of the chairs. The coffee bar line's too long, you know. All the, and you go, wait a minute, stop, don't go there. You've got to spend enough time with God to get God's perspective on stuff. Proverbs chapter uh, uh, 3 says that if we trust the Lord with all our heart, lean not on our own understanding, acknowledge Him in all our ways that He will direct our paths. You know, when you need healing from the Lord before you go to the medicine cabinet, I know that's an old, most people don't go to the medicine cabinet anymore, but th here's the idea. We need to, acknowledge God and ask God for healing before we just go take care of it ourselves. There's nothing wrong with medicine. There's nothing wrong with uh, going to the doctors and getting medicine. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. There's times he may tell you not to take that medication. As a friend of mine, the doctor uh, uh, gave her medication and um, she's on our staff and she said, I went to take my medication. The Lord told me not to take it. I said, what do you mean, not to take the medicine your doctor gave? The Lord told me not to take it. And uh, so she quit taking this medicine that she was on. And uh, sure enough, she went and they had, they had written her a script for the wrong medicine. And it was actually hurting her body, but the Lord told her not to take that medicine. See, it's so important that we learn to acknowledge God in all of our ways that he will direct our steps. And all of a sudden, what began to happen with Moses is he couldn't get the people into the promised land, and Jesus was able to get us in. Jesus is able to get us into eternity. Jesus is able to get us, listen, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He made a way where there seemed to be no way. And this morning, some of you are in turmoil in your marriages. Some of you are in turmoil in your finances. Some of you are, are under pressure that you've never been under before. And God's saying, listen, true rest... It's not laying in a hammock someplace, uh, uh, free from all the cares and the worries and the trials of life. True rest is being able to trust God in spite of what you're going through. True rest is having a, a reliance and a belief that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and that God will make a way for you where there seems to be no way. Now turn with me, if you would, over to, uh, well, let's read 7 again, 7 and 8 and 9 of of chapter 3. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, can you say voice? voice? Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. The people were under a trial. They had left Egypt. They're going to the promised land and they spent 40 extra years out in the wilderness because, listen, because they, they didn't hear. The Bible says that God speaks to us through his word and he speaks to us in our spirit. Now we have to learn the difference between our spirit, the enemy of your soul, and the Holy Spirit. Anybody remember back in the day when you used to have those transistor radios? You know, you'd kind of get the right dial, the right spot on the dial, trying to get rid of the static and make a clear sound. God is wanting, listen, to make sure that you have a clear sound. The Bible says, my sheep know my voice. The problem is we're so addicted to busy, and we're going 90 miles an hour all the time, and we get this done, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and we keep going, and we say we got to do more, and we got to work harder, and the Bible teaches us in Ephesians that, that it's not by our good works. It's learning to trust. It's learning to rest in God. Some of you, some of you young women who are looking for a husband, settle down already. God knows what you need before you even ask. He knows who you're going to be with and who's going to be best for you. So quit trying to make it happen in your own strength. Learn to trust God, rely on God, so that God can bring you the right one. But see, what happens is we, we want to make it happen. We got to do it. We got to go make it. And all of a sudden, we start making bad choices because we want what we want so bad that we, then we get angry at God when it doesn't happen. We get hooked up with the wrong one. 
I got to be honest with you. You're better off being lonely on a Friday night than being miserable your whole life. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. So what's happening is we've got major decisions to make all the time in our life. Decisions about marriage, decisions about work, decisions about what school we go to, decisions about our finances. Uh, God's leading us this way. or leading, And what's happening is we're, we're moving so quick and so fast that we're not really trusting in him. And so therefore, we've got to make four, five, six, seven, eight, ten bad decisions before we make one right one. And God's saying that you're in danger of not entering into your rest. As a pastor who's been serving in ministry now for over 30 years, one of the things I've learned very clearly, it's not by power, by might, but by his spirit. It's not how hard I can work. It's by how quickly I can both listen and obey when he speaks to me. I'll never forget the time I uh, had been saving money up uh, as a teenager to buy a softball mitt. Softball season was upon us. I wanted a, this beautiful softball mitt. I'd never uh, bought one before. I've always used someone else's, and I, and I found a nice one, $80. And I, It took me a long time to save up for it, but I was ready to go buy that mitt that night. But before I went to buy it, I went to church that day, doggone it. <laughs> I'm at church, and I got the $80 in my pocket. I'm going to buy that uh, softball mitt, and I'm sitting there, and sure enough, they have a missionary. I'm like, Doug on it. <laughs> sure enough, the Lord speaks to me. He says, give that $80 of your baseball mitt. Give it to the missionary. I'm like, Doug on it. I shouldn't have come to church tonight. <laughs> Isn't that amazing how the human nature works? I'm resisting doing what God wants me to do because what I want, and God's saying, listen, if you do what I'm asking you to do, you'll get so much better. But I'm still thinking about my $80 mitt. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm like, here's your $80. Take that. You know, that summer, I never, I never, got on the, I never signed up for the softball team, and I never played softball. I was going to go buy the mitt. And I realize now that that glove would have sat in the garage for the next season. And God was showing me that I could sow that money into something that would be meaningful and have lasting benefits rather than a baseball mitt that sat in my garage for the next year. And I thanked him after that, thanking God, thank you for not letting me waste my mitt on a, on a mitt that was going to sit in the garage. I can, I can make a difference in reaching people for Christ. Somebody say Amen. Now turn to chapter 4. I'm going to spend the, most, the rest of my time here in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his what? Rest. Rest. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. Now look at verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God what? God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, he says, thou shalt not enter my rest. Now watch this. Jesus had three and a half years, he had a mission. He had to come train the disciples, he had to die on a cross, he had to rise from the dead. He knew he had a limited amount of time. And do you know how many times that Jesus began to go up to the mountains to pray? It's, it's amazing. You think, if anyone's got to be busy, it's Jesus. He's got three and a half years to change the world. But in three and a half years, he finds himself praying in the garden. He goes to the mountain. He's out on the Sea of Galilee. He's out spending time with his father. Let me say, you're not too busy, friend. You're not that busy as Jesus was. And God is looking for you to, to enter into a rest with him, a trust with him, a perspective in your heart and in your mind that God can make a way where there seems to be no way, where you fully rely and fully trust that God can do for you what you are unable to do for, with your, by yourself in the flesh. Verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, 
And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of what? Okay, now all of a sudden he says, there's people who are not entering into that full trust because of their disobedience. Let's just be honest. There's times when you and I are disobedient. We're not listening. We're not obeying. We're doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. And God's saying, you can do that, but you're not going to accomplish the things that I can accomplish in the flesh. He designates a certain day, saying David, and listen to this, he says, today, after such a long time as it has been, and he quotes here in this, in chapter 3 he quotes it, in chapter 4 he quotes it, he says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. Therefore, remain, there remains therefore a rest For the people of God, listen to this, verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So God's saying to the people of God, listen, you're running 90 miles an hour, you're living in a culture that doesn't value rest, you've got loud noise and music going on everywhere from your car to the the house, to the church, there's always noise going on and God's saying, how many of my children, listen, will take the time to slow down and spend time in my words so that I can speak to them about their lives. A.W. Tozer wrote a book years ago called In Pursuit of God. See, we all want God to do his part, but God's saying, how come you won't do your part? We all want God to do for us what we can't do, but God's saying, how many of you will poise yourself and pursue me to get to know me in such a way that when I speak, you hear my voice and you'll obey my voice? The word in Hebrew here is a very interesting word. It doesn't mean just hear a sound. We can make lots of sounds. But to hear God's voice, listen, is to hear and have a heart to obey it. To hear. You know what I'm saying? When the Lord said, I want you to give the $80 of your baseball mitt, it, I heard it, but I didn't like it. You know what I'm saying? Lord, you want me to what? $80 to who? I want it. It's for me. This is, this is my season. I want, I've never had one. And I begin to rationalize. And I begin to try to get God to do what I want him to do. God said, I asked you to give the mitt, and I want you to do it with a right heart. See, God's people aren't interested in just hearing, but hearing and obeying. Because when we hear and obey, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. You got to understand something about God this morning. God loves you. God has a purpose and a plan for you. God's ways, listen, are not your ways. And we're living in a time where you, you understand. Do you understand that God's called you to this church because there's a greater purpose? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Instead of sitting around waiting for revival to happen, God's saying, listen, revival's going to happen when you personally get revived and you bring a busload of your own neighbors. Let's, let's quit waiting for, listen, we, 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 got, we, we put this this way. We go, well, if Pastor Bucci would just preach better, you know, we'll, we'll have even more people. No, you know, thank God for, the, for Pastor Bucci and his gift to be able to communicate. But the body is not just made up of a communicator. It's got to be receivers. It's people hearing and obeying. The Bible says be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. All of a sudden you realize that God uses Pastor Bucci to communicate his word, but the word, listen, goes out and and people have to hear it and be willing to put it in their own lives and make a difference. So all of a sudden you begin to understand that if you're going to accomplish your purpose and your plan, listen, you've often got to learn to believe God and obey God in the small things. Whoever's faithful with little, the Bible says, will be faithful with much. I was talking with a a woman after the first service today, and she said, well, I I used to go to church here way back when, when we started the church, and she started giving me a little history. And she said, I was gone for like 10 years. My husband passed away. But she says, I'm back now. This is my church. And and, and you could tell that, that she came back. She was away for a while, but she came back. And look what God's done when she came back. For some of you, listen, we've got to get beyond the house. The Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
And the way that you're going to make a difference in the life of your wife or your husband or your kids or your family or your friends or your neighbors or your co-workers or your, or your fellow students at school is because you're going to be marching to the beat of a different drum than everyone else is marching to. That God's going to use you to say things. God's going to send you places. God's going to lead you places. God's going to cause you by his spirit to say things and do things and go places that you would never go on your own. We've got to begin to understand that there is a rest that God has provided, and it's learning to trust him, listen, in every area of your life. Now, I'm not just preaching to you this morning. I'm preaching to me. Been in ministry for a long time. I do a lot of things around the world. We travel to Egypt and Israel. We're we're, uh, taking trips out to California. There's things happening all the time, and here's what I've learned. My most successful moments in in the Lord in ministry is when I've simply heard and obeyed what he had to say. There's a lot of good things we can do, but how many of you know there's a difference between good ideas and God ideas? And when you enter into rest, you're more more concerned about what God's saying than you are about what you have to do next. When we come to the end of ourselves, the ministry of Jesus Christ really begins. So after 30 years of ministry, I I felt the Lord challenging me, David, you've got to learn to rest in me. I know you've got buildings to build that you want to, I know you want this to be done. You want this to happen. You want to get this done. You want to add on a new building. You want to get a new children's wing. You want to do all these things. But the reality is this, when you and I learn to trust him, God can say, okay, I got more coming. And rather than you freaking out and saying, I'm too tired, I can't do anymore, you begin to recognize that God said, "I I can do more with your listening and obedient life than I can for you trying to make it happen in your own strength. There's a promise of rest and some of us this morning are in danger of not entering into it. Pastor was telling me, well, we've got about, I don't know, uh, we want to raise enough money for the other project for the kids and I thought, well, you can go after finishing a building like this, it'd be a little daunting task. That's a big task to go back and raise money for another spot. And I said, Pastor, here's how we have to do it. We got to get people to rest and quit worrying about what they're supposed to do. Listen to God and just do what God tells them to do. See, if God speaks to you and says, okay, I want you to give $100,000 to this project, somebody's got to say, amen. You know what I'm talking about? Not like me when I didn't want to give my baseball mitt money. For some of you, it's not $100,000. For some of you, it's $5. And you've got to quit whining about it. Quit complaining about it. And put $5, children's ministry, and put it in the offering, and thank God that he's going to use your $5 to make a difference. It's not the amount that you give. It's your willingness to be obedient to what God's showing you. But if we stay so busy, and we run so fast, and we're only pursuing what we want, then all of a sudden, we lose sight of the fact that God's got a mission and a purpose for your life. And it's to make a a lasting, significant difference. Someone, well, pastor, I just, you know, we're just born into this world and we die, pay taxes and we die. No, 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 that's, that's for worldly people. That's for people who don't understand Ephesians chapter two, that we were created before the foundations of the earth to walk in, in the plans and purposes of God. He goes on to say, and I gotta remember, this, these two passages in, in chapter three and chapter four of Hebrews are actually references to Psalm 95. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. In David's day, he was talking about the people of God. He says, today. We know that today is a day of salvation. That we're living in a time where God's plan is to make sure that every person in the world hears a salvation message that gives them an opportunity to accept Christ and to embrace him so they can be forgiven of their sins. And the Bible says when you die, your spirit stays alive for all eternity. John chapter 3 is clear. You must be born again. What he says, what he's saying here is you're not just to be led by your five natural senses, that he wants to lead you by his spirit. And all of a sudden you realize, how does a person get saved? By having their sins forgiven. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the sins that all of us have committed. The word discovers our condition. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. 
Pastor Eric on the way to the airport was talking to us and saying how valuable it is to be able to self-examine your life and your heart before God. Quit judging everybody else. Have God look at your own heart. God, what are you doing in me? Shine the light of your Holy Spirit on the inside of me so I can see where I'm falling short. It's not my job to go fix everybody. My job is to make sure that I'm staying where I need to be. So all of a sudden, after 30 years of ministry, um, Cheryl and I have been married 30 years, so all of a sudden, here we are. This past year, I called Pastor Eric a couple months ago, and my board recommended that I take a sabbatical. Now, a sabbatical is kind of an extended time away from your customary work, either to study or to get new skills uh, and to uh, uh, really take a, a break. And I thought to myself when they said this to me three years ago, oh, I'm not, I don't have time for that. I, I'm building stuff. I'm doing stuff. I got to go. I'm, I'm doing stuff. And I began to realize that a sabbatical is not laying on a hammock someplace in the sun. But a sabbatical is saying, God, I've got to tune other things out so I can tune you in more. It's kind of like fasting. Fasting is not um, just giving up food. It's really a hunger that says, I want God. I'm going to do whatever it takes to be able to get into his presence. So this morning, as I, I believe that God sent me here to deliver this message, don't resist a rest. Entering into a rest right now is so important where you are as a church because God's going to begin to speak things and accomplish things, listen, that you could have never accomplished in your own strength. There's two ways that we can get you to listen and hear God's voice better. Number one, to receive Jesus Christ. He'll wash away your sins and bring you into his family and help you be the, the member, be, the, be the, the, the believer that God can use to bring life into the last days. That's one way. The second one is to take Christians. Christians who believe in Christ, who've followed him, know about him in their head, they know about him. But, but if we were to be honest this morning, there's times where you're running so fast, you haven't heard God's voice in a long time. And you doubt whether God speaks today as he used to speak to you in the past. And God still speaks today. He speaks to us. But let me ask you a serious question. When's the last time regularly you spent 15 minutes in the Word every day. Well, pastor, you're just getting on my case. No, I'm not getting on your case. I'm saying if you want to hear God's voice, you've got to put some tenderizer on that meat of your heart. See, some of you have been marinating the, the meat for your grill all week long. You're getting ready to grill out today or tomorrow, and, and you've you prepared everything. God's saying prepare your heart for me to do what I want to do in you and through you. But some of you will get right up to the day and not do it before and wonder why the meat that you're eating doesn't taste as good as it could. <laughs> oh, you didn't buy any barbecue sauce? No, I forgot. Now, you can make it work. How many of you know you can make it work without barbecue sauce? You know what I'm saying? You, you can make it. But I'm telling you, if you want the best, you need to work that thing. You need to prepare that thing. You need to get things ready. And God's saying this morning to this church, I really believe this, that God's about ready to speak some things and to do some things. And if you and I don't enter into that rest, we, may very, we might miss what God wants to say to us about our life. It's not just the children's ministry. It's some gentleman in the service today is praying for a wife and he's wondering how he can get the right wife and he's looking for the right wife and he's about ready to make a choice that is the wrong choice you need to spend some time with God and let God begin to direct your steps. How many of you know man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart? All of a sudden, you begin to realize you can make a poor choice because you're looking at only what you see, not what God's saying. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. We opened up the service this morning singing about that. I can't get over this passage where he says, today, if you will hear his voice. 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 Somebody said, well, pastor, does he call you like a bat phone and call you up and speak to you? And No, it's not always that way. Sometimes it's a still, small voice. It's almost like a whisper that I, that I catch, but when I catch it, I know 
that God's doing something new and fresh. But I want you to begin to understand this morning, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily which, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Here's the challenge. Many of us think everything's okay with our spiritual lives, and it's not, and we think it is. Why? Just because you come into church doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you go into your garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you go into McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. But make someone a Christian, listen, is that they have a living faith that's connected to a living God that speaks to you spirit to spirit, where his word can come alive off the pages of a Bible and begin to work in you so that you do what he asks you to do and you do it with a willing heart. I don't know about you, but that's not easy these days. It's not easy with God's people who are so full of themselves. It's not easy with God's people who are who wanting what they want rather than God. You, you find me a people who who are loving each other and honoring each other. Listen to what this banner says over here. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Look at this one over here. It says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God and honor the king. Anyone can talk bad about a president. But who's praying for the president? Anyone can speak badly of the pastor, but who's praying for their pastor? Let me challenge you with this. Several months ago, a group of guys got together in our, men group, our men's group, and they said, you know what? We're going to start this, what they call the nickel defense. Nickel defense on the football field is when you take maybe a couple of the ends out and you put a couple of linebackers in. You can figure it out if you're not a sports guy. But here's what they did. They said, we're going to pray for our pastor five days this week. And when we get to church on Sunday, we're going to give the pastor a nickel. And the nickel is a reminder that I've prayed for you five days in a row. And every Sunday I gather, there'll be guys that come up, and they'll come up, and they don't talk and tell me. what they, they give me a nickel. And I come up to the pulpit with a pocket full of nickels in my pocket. And I'll just tell you, there's something about going up to the pulpit to preach, knowing that God's people are praying for me, not just whining about me. Not complaining about me, but praying for me. Doesn't mean they agree with me about everything. Doesn't matter. It means I don't, I don't you know, it, it, it just means that, that we need to esteem each other higher than ourselves. We quit, need to be, quit being like the children of the old, uh, Israel in the Old Testament where we whine and complain and murmur. God's done so many great things in our lives. I think Pastor Eric said this morning, he said an attitude of gratitude where you to be thankful for what you have rather than whine about what you don't have. How do, you, how, do, how do the Christians really get marinated and live in that spot? I'll tell you how. They learn to slow down. In Israel, they call it Shabbat Shalom. It's a rest of God. It's, it's not just to take a nap. It's learning to lean in and to trust God like you've never trusted Him before. I'm going to trust you, Lord, with my marriage. I, I can't understand it. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I'm going to rely on you. I'm going to trust you that you're going to make a way with my marriage where there seems to be no way. Lord, I'm going to trust you with my finances. I haven't worked in six months, and I don't know where my house payment's coming from, but I'm going to lean into you, and I'm going to trust you like I've never trusted you before. I'm going to say the right things. I'm going to do the right things, even though I can't see how the answer's coming. Maybe it's broken relationships. Maybe it's you have an addiction in your life, and you don't know how you're going to be set free from it. And God says to you, listen, I want you to trust me like you've never trusted me before. Enter into a level of rest, listen, that we've only heard about, but very few have entered into it. And if we're going to enter the next season of the ministry of this church, it's going to be with people, listen, that understand that it's not by power, it's not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here this morning and you want to give your heart to Christ, you want to be forgiven of your sins, 
You've known about God in your, your head, but you want to know him in your heart this morning. You, you want that spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, to come alive on the inside of you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. When I count to three, I'm going to ask that if you'd lift your hand. When you lift your hand, you're saying, I surrender to Christ. I want to be forgiven of my past. I want to be part of God's family. One, two, three. Throw your hand up real quickly. Say, Pastor, that's me. Hands all over this room. Here, here. Hold them up. Here, 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 all over. Listen, this is an extremely important moment. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. And I know you say, well, I don't want to do this, Pastor, but I'm going to challenge you anyway. If you raised your hand this morning, I need you to join me up here at the altar right now. There's so many of you. I want to pray a prayer with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. But if you lifted your hand and you know God's moving in your heart right now, would you join me up here real quickly right now? Just come right forward out of your seat. I'm believing that God is going to move in a fresh way in your life and your heart today. Would you come? Let's thank the Lord for these that are coming. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on up. This is for people who are putting their faith in Christ for the first time. Would you pray this prayer with me, everyone? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again to give me a new life. I receive you right now. Now let me pray for you. Father, thank you for moving by your spirit. But these men and women who join me up here at the altar today, Lord, are realizing like we all have to someday, we need you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank, for, thank you for sacrificing your life. We love you and we need you. And Lord, help us begin to grow. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Let's thank the Lord for these that have come forward. Can we do that? Now, let me just take a moment for you believers out here. You're, you're, you're followers of Christ. You've already made that decision. But how many of you would be honest with me this morning and say, Pastor, there's, there's a level of rest that I'm in danger of missing, and I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to ask God to slow my perspective, my life down a bit, and press into God so that I don't miss the next move of his spirit. How many would say there's a level of rest that you need to enter into because you've been going 99 miles an hour and you don't know how to get off the treadmill? Throw your hand up real quickly if that's you. Pastor, can you relate to that? Can somebody relate this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, all over this room, we say and declare we need you and we need to help, help us slow down Help us to come to a fresh new place in you where we hear and obey your voice so that your will on earth is done as it is in heaven. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the leadership of this church. And in this moment, Lord, I'm believing that you're sending new, new, new things and, 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 and resources and, and people and, and all sorts of things. This church is about ready to explode, but it's only going to come as we hear and obey you. I pray right now that our hearing ear will be open in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you, Pastor. Thanks so much, Dan. I really appreciate it. Thank you for that good word today. And uh, I'm going to ask that the ushers would be so kind and get ready. And also, I want to encourage maybe someone to help me out. There's a basket on the uh, information table. We have some things to help you along as you're making more commitment to Christ. We have something called the next, uh, 10 Steps Closer to Christ. We're going to start again in June every week to help you grow in Christ as well. But we believe God has good plans for everybody here. And uh, today, right after this service, you're welcome to come to lunch. We have some spaces open. It's going to be Church 201 and, uh, Essentials. And the four things that you need to do to help grow in Christ, to become the person that God's called you to become. Listen, at this time, I, this is an opportunity. We just want to, I want to sow into Pastor David and Cheryl. And he's got something called Leaders, Leaders for Christ, and they have a property out in the Yosemite National Park area, and where they're having a place where they take 30 or 40 people at a time, and they spend a week just praying and teaching about God and how to hear God out in, in the nature. It's just an incredible, wonderful ministry of rest and rehabilitation for people's spirits. 
So I want to be able to do that today. So if you want to go ahead and do that, there's no, there's no pressure involved. If you'd like to, you can. If you don't want to, that's fine too. But we want to be able just to sow into what he's done. I appreciate what he's sowing into us and what he's sowing to me personally. So let's just pray right now. Father, thank you so much for me. Thank you. For Pastor Dave and Cheryl, I thank you so much for what you're doing and what you've done and what you're going to do in their lives. And we just pray a special blessing upon them as this season of rest. And we thank you, Father, when we, when we enter rest, you can do the rest. And I just thank you that as he enters this rest, I thank you you're going to do the rest that he needs you to do. And so we thank you for that. We ask you to bless him. And we thank you for this opportunity today, Lord, that we continue to grow in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and usher us. You can go ahead and do that. And just take a few moments to, to while we do that. And I really mean that. If you, we have some spaces, probably about five or ten spaces at least, if you want to come to lunch today, right at Sal's house. It's the little house right out there. It's going to start at 1230. Just about an hour and, and, and 20 minute time. We have some lunch together. And hear about the four things that help you grow closer to Jesus Christ and become a vibrant person that is moving forward. It's important to know that. So, amen. Why don't you go ahead and lead us in a couple closing songs. And as we do that, we'll dismiss you a little bit later. Go ahead and dismiss you. The sound is a bank of music play. Let's get you prayer. Bring it all. Please come forward. We also have something to help you. If you prayed that prayer today, you want something to help you. Come on forward. Otherwise, we dismiss you. God bless you.